So it's a great pleasure to have Vladimir Rosenhaus, who's a postdoc at Institute for Advanced Studies, Princeton. And uh, uh, like, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, people all, all know what he did, but like just for the students, he did his PhD from UC Berkeley, first postdoc from Santa Barbara, KITP, uh, and right now this is his sec second postdoc, and he is going to talk about his last paper, uh, which is very interesting. And uh, after seeing that, I have decided to ask him to give a talk on this. So he is going to speak about chaos in uh, scattering metrics. So uh, Vladimir, it's like great pleasure to have in this QASTM seminar series. This is the 37th seminar. So you are the 37th speaker in the list. And uh, we all welcome you from Potsdam. So you can start. Thank you. Um, uh, and thanks for the invitation. Um, this should be a fairly uh, easy and relaxed talk. So uh, yeah, it's a very I'll relaxed talk. talk. You can take your time. There is no hurry. So, uh, like I told you, that it is the maximum length is two hours. Uh, it it is because of the fact that I want people should ask question and there should be some discussion. Okay. So it doesn't mean that you have to continue for two hours. Might be there might be a lot of questions. I'll I just show a few pictures and then uh, then we can go home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the the question the question is is really how can we characterize chaos in quantum field theory? And to set it up, when when um, one thinks of chaos, one thinks of something like this. This is uh, a phase diagram of the Lorentz map which Lorenz did in the 60s. Lorenz was interested in understanding the weather. Uh, Navier-Stokes equations, that's uh, a field theory. There are lots, an infinite number of variables, so that's challenging. So he simplified the problem and came up with some model that just has a, a three-dimensional phase space, three variables. Uh, and then uh, he made a plot of the phase space and um, discovered the butterfly effect. Um, a butterfly here appears in, in two ways. Um, the, the first way is that, uh, so here's uh, a trajectory in phase space and you can see it essentially, so it goes in here, it revolves around this wing for a few revolutions, then it goes over to this one for a few, and so on and so forth. So it's confined to butterfly wings, but really the reason for the name is that a small change in initial conditions, oh dear, someone is writing, that's not me. Um, well, anyway, a small change in initial conditions uh, leads to a large, a large. Uh, How is it possible? Because it is your screen is sharing. I'm not. I don't even know how to write, and I don't have a green pen. So <laughs> it's not me. <laughs> anyway, uh, Actually, maybe somebody it's else. To turn that off. Uh, there should be an option where you can turn off uh, other people writing on the screen. Well, maybe uh, maybe someone has comments. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, forget about that. Just uh, and so, so that's what we think of chaos. We think of chaos as as motion in phase space. Usually, uh, phase space is small because we can't think of a picture with many dimensions, and that a small change in initial conditions leads to a large change. Uh, and so, then the question of chaos in quantum field theory, we need to go from that to what we naturally think about in quantum field theory, which is not phase space and not a few degrees of freedom and it's not classical mechanics. And so, so that's, that's why we have uh, the question of how do we characterize chaos in quantum field theory. Um, and so all I'm going to do is, um, based on some intuition from studies of chaotic scattering in classical and quantum mechanics, I'm going to propose uh, that chaos is visible in the quantum field theory S matrix. So I think really I'm, uh, what I'm going to, just try to do is to motivate um, think studying chaos in the context of, of the S matrix, uh, that the S matrix is, is uh, a potential probe of chaos in quantum field theory. 
uh, which doesn't seem to have been explored. So here's a picture of the S matrix. Uh, so, so that's the goal. The goal is to, is to get from the classical understanding of chaos to uh, something we can work with in quantum field theory. Is it possible to erase this thing since it appears it's going to be on every slide? Uh, actually, I'll stop the sharing and then restart it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Where was I? Ah, yes, okay. Um, so it's slightly interesting that um, uh, explorations, even though we think of chaos as that picture, um, the, the questions of chaos, in fact, began in the context of many bodies, many body physics, classical physics, but many body. Um, and, and this few body chaos, which is what is sort of ingrained in our heads, is, is, um, was studied as a simplification um, that was done to simplify the problem. And then it turned out that, uh, the questions are interesting just in the few body context and then going back to the original um, many body problems that motivate even in classical systems so let me um before moving on let me start start with some motivation uh for why one should study chaos um since we don't really study um chaos. We mostly study non-chaotic things, um, at least physicists. And so, so why is that? So we gain intuition by solving simple problems, uh, harmonic oscillator, two-body problem, and, and so on. And more precisely, the, the systems we're familiar with are integrable. Um, they have enough conserved quantities to allow us to easily solve the equations of motion. Um, but of course, we realize that integrable systems are not generic. Um, but, there is, but we might hope that um, we can solve everything else, at least approximately, by doing perturbation theory around uh, the integrable case. Um, and that's certainly how we do many things. We first uh, solve the harmonic oscillator, then we do everything else by perturbation theory. Uh, indeed, when we learn quantum field theory, um, that's what we do. Well, we learn many things. Um, um, and so in introductory physics, there's an extensive discussion of the two-body problem, but little mention of the three-body problem. Uh, and the reason appears clear, the equations in the three-body case are much harder and it wouldn't seem fair to ask a freshman to solve them. Um, but in Hello. fact, yes? Yeah, I have a question. So uh, are you excluding integrable systems uh, from your definition of chaos or uh, because- I haven't I haven't yet given a definition of chaos. Okay. Uh, have I? Um, oh, in, in the context of classical mechanics. Yeah, but oh. I, yeah, in, in your, uh, uh, means, uh, means you, you spoke about uh, relating it to the S metric. Yes. Right, so um, my, my question is, are you, uh, means, uh, are you including also integrable systems or are you looking only at non-integrable systems? Good, good, good. So um, in, um, when we try to come up with a definition of chaos and quantum field theory, um, so, so I guess you're thinking about integrable two-dimensional quantum field theories. So presumably uh, the definition we come up with, we should not find that integrable. Well, it's not totally clear, but um, most likely we would not want the integrable uh, two-dimensional quantum field theories to be considered chaotic. Uh, I'm asking this because it is not clear because even uh, even large C, uh, CFTs are have an integrable structure. Uh, good. I think we should distinguish two things. So, good, good, good. Excellent. I'm glad you raised it. So, this is good. So, if we're considering systems, let's say classical systems or quantum systems with a few degrees of freedom, um, uh, then the definition of integrable is that there are as many conserved quantities as degrees of freedom. Uh, and if that's the case, we can just completely solve it. And then 
the if you plot the motion in phase space, uh, there's a big distinction between integrable and non-integrable. If it's integrable, it remains uh, confined to a torus. It's a very small subset of the phase space because you have to maintain all these conserved quantities so you're not exploring the full phase space. Uh, whereas if it's fully uh, ergodic, it, it's, it's exploring all the phase space. And so there's a clear distinction. If the system is, um, it can be not totally integrable and not totally um, chaotic if you perturb the integrable system somewhat away, then uh, you have some mixture. But if you make a plot in phase space, say a Poincaré section of the phase space, just slice it, then you'll see a clear distinction. In the integrable case, it's just confined uh, to some trajectory. In the chaotic case, it fully fills space space. Now, in the case of, of a field theory with infinitely many degrees of freedom, the distinction is now more challenging because there are an infinite number of degrees of freedom. So just having an infinite number of conserved quantities doesn't yet um, mean you have as many conserved quantities as degrees of freedom because both are infinite. So it's not reasonable to compare. And uh, the 2D CFT is, is a good case of this because it is true all 2D CFTs have uh, Vera Soro and so an infinite number of degrees of freedom, but many of them, all the ones with high central charge, they're chaotic. Um, and so these two things are not exclusive um, because they're an infinite number of degrees of freedom. Uh, and, and, and your discussion about S matrix will try to make a distinction or a classification? Um, my discussion. Um, or maybe but so, uh, yeah, yeah. So um, perhaps when we get to that part, uh, we can ask again of um, what occurs for two dimensional integral quantum field theories. But that's the only. Um, as far as I know, it's only for two-dimensional field theories where there's um, even a definition of, of what it means to be an integrable field theory. There's an interesting question you could ask for quantum field theories in higher dimensions. What's the definition of integrable? So the definition of, of integrable two-dimensional quantum field theories is that there's no particle production um, yes. for one species. If you, you, can't, you can't apply that definition for higher dimensional field theories because then you just get free theories back. Um, so uh, there is in that context an interesting question of what would be um, an integrable field theory in higher dimensions if, if there is such a thing. Um, but I won't have anything to say about that. Okay. Uh, does that answer the question? Sure, sure. Um, good. So going going back a uh, hundred years, uh, two hundred years. So um, as we said, we we extensively study the two body problem, uh, Earth moving around the sun, uh, but we don't really study the three body problem. And um, the reason at first thought appears because it's just uh, too hard to study the three body case. Um, and then one learns that, in fact, the three-body case has no closed-form solution. So it's, it's not that we don't study it just because it's hard, but there's really no closed-form solution. Um, however, I think many of us, when learning about this, would think it's more of a mathematical curiosity that there is or isn't a closed-form solution, because we, we have a good sense of how the Earth, Sun, Moon system works. Uh, basically, we just, um, uh, in our heads, we're just, uh, doing a superposition of, of two body problems uh, and that seems to work to work fine um, and, and so from from intuition about looking at the solar system uh, you might think we don't really need um, the fact that we took linearized things seems good enough um, so from this you would draw the conclusion you don't need to study chaos um, on the other hand, when we study statistical mechanics um, and we need to solve for the motion of, of a large number of particles in a box, we immediately claim in ignorance. Um, what we do is we say that the system is so complicated that we're safe to assume that even if we took the particles to initially have definite position and momentum, they're equally likely to be anywhere. And so we replace our very specific initial conditions with the microcanonical ensemble. 
uh, and, and that, that's how we proceed in statistical mechanics. Um, and on first thought, thought, this sounds like a reasonable assumption. Um, on the other hand, we, we dynamically, we really have little understanding of how this is achieved. Um, as we just discussed a minute ago, in mechanics, we said that trajectories um, in, in integrable systems move on, on periodic orbits which only pass through a small fraction of phase space because as we said, there are all these conserved quantities and so you can't explore most of the phase space. You're just confined uh, to the surfaces on which that conserved quantity is the constant it started off with. Um, and now we're, we're saying something completely up. The opposite, we're saying that a single trajectory, just some location moves through the, all of phase space. Uh, and so that's, that's the complete opposite of, of integrable. And so um, in statistical mechanics, when we get to statistical mechanics, we're using this assumption of, of molecular chaos to justify ergodicity. Um, ergodicity being that the single trajectory fills all the space, space space, and we usually go on to say that that's ultimately due to chaos. And so um, it seems that, that, uh, that when we learn mechanics, we say we don't need chaos. When we learn statistical mechanics, it's the foundation of everything. Um, and so one may be led to draw two conclusions, I think. Um, the first is that chaos is only relevant to many bodies, um, at least from the two examples I gave, that's a reasonable conclusion. And that the equations are so complicated that it's not surprising we have little understanding of the dynamics. So um, I guess we would say that because we have n particles, uh, there's just lots of particles, everything is complicated, so um, that's why we, we got to the situation where we, we, can't, um, uh, we can't really derive um, this assumption of ergodicity. Um, and the second conclusion one might have is that in highly chaotic many body systems, such as this box of gas or the weather, we can't calculate or predict much anyway, uh, so again, there's not much for us to study. So, so those are two conclusions one might reasonably draw. Um, in fact, both of those conclusions are false. Uh, the first one is false because chaos occurs in few body systems. It actually even occurs in very simple uh, discrete maps. Um, and the second is false because there is in fact much we can calculate. <clears throat> it's not the case that just because the system is chaotic, we can't calculate anything. We just need the right tools and the right questions. Um, and at least theoretically, it would seem that chaos is far more generic than integrability or near integrability. Um, <clears throat> um, and it's proved relevant in, in a broad range of applications. And so um, going to quantum field theory seems reasonable. Are there any um, questions? Any questions, please ask. Uh, sorry, maybe I could ask you a question. So, uh, I mean, there are these observables that traditionally we calculate, calculate in statistical mechanics, right? So even though the system it might be chaotic, that it doesn't forbid us from calculating uh, maybe the, 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 the average expectation value of the observables, right? Exactly. Maybe, maybe exactly. we cannot calculate all the moments, but, uh, but uh, some, some stuff we can calculate. Exactly, so the, the thing, like you said, the thing we would want to calculate is no longer um, given these initial conditions, what happens, but some kind of averages, uh, yeah. correlation functions. Um, that's right. Uh, and that is uh, a, uh, an a thing you can hope to be able to calculate for some systems and one that's experimentally measurable. Um, and so, um, and to do that calculation, one needs some understanding of, of chaos ultimately, if, if the system is chaotic. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, good. So in going back to classical physics, so chaos in classical physics, it's characterized by stretching and folding. That's the slogan. Um, a region of phase space uh, experiences stretching along unstable directions with an average rate given by 
by the Lyapin of exponents, uh, so it stretches, and then it experiences folding in order to remain confined to a, a finite region of phase space. Um, and so this, um, what's, so this, um, this puzzling thing that, um, so we know if it's chaotic, if you start with uh, two points in phase space, then they rapidly diverge from each other. So we need to satisfy that. And we also need to satisfy of remaining in a confined region of phase space. And these two things seem difficult to satisfy. And the way chaos solves this is that a small uh, initial localized patch of phase space evolves into this extremely complex structure. So, um, which is spread throughout all the available space space while still maintaining the same volume as the initial patch as required by Louisville's theorem. So if, if, if um, right, so we, we start with this small ball and now pieces are going to expand away, some are going to exponentially contract, uh, but the ball, the volume of the ball has to remain the same. And so the ball is going to, on the other hand, you still need regions to expand far away. And so it's going to evolve into this extremely complicated structure, which was folded over on itself um, many times and, and so on, uh, which is fairly remarkable. Uh, and and that's, the, that's, um, that's sort of the image of, of chaos in, in classical mechanics. And uh, an image like that, um, just to picture it, is some guess we like to have in, in quantum field theory, just some intuitive understanding of, of what chaos is, which, which seems to still be missing. So, so, so that's, that's classical mechanics. In, in quantum chaos, um, there's, there's no phase space. Now, generally, um, the state space is not phase space, but rather that of the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. And so um, one needs to formulate things in, in terms of those. And, um, and um, a connection that was made in, in the 80s was that quantum systems, which are classically chaotic, are known to exhibit certain universal features, like as, such as Wigner-Dyson statistics for the energy eigenvalues. So this was, um, this was started by this paper by BGS. So what, what they did is, is um, if, we, um, if we take a classically chaotic system, so an example is, is, is a ball in a stadium. Uh, you can take the stadium to be a various shapes, and then if there's an obstacle, um, so if the stadium is, is uh, a circle, then it's not chaotic, it's clearly integrable because, well, you can just compute the trajectories. If you take uh, most, many shapes, uh, not a circle, but an ellipse, then it becomes chaotic. Alternatively, you could take a circle and then put an obstacle in the center, and that's a nice billiards, and that's chaotic. And so what, um, what was done in the 80s by BGS is to, to make this connection between classical uh, chaos and quantum chaos is they took uh, one of these stadiums, it's a, nice, it's a nice billiard, which classically is chaotic, and then they solved Schrodinger's equation, so the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, and they looked at the um, they looked at the level spacings between energy levels and plotted that distribution, um, and um, they got Wigner Dyson statistics. Um, just like you get a random matrix theory, and then, then they made a conjecture that this is something universal, that if, if we take a classically chaotic system and then quantize, then this is what we'll get. Um, I have a question here. Yes. So, like, uh, can we say the opposite is true as well? By which I mean that if we are having a quantum system and it's following Wigner Dyson statistic, can we say that uh, uh, it's sort of chaotic? Like, uh, uh, what we are doing in quantum systems is that we are comparing the classical version, right? We are always talking about the classical version and saying that uh, the, they exhibit chaos and uh, hence we might study their quantum version and they might be exhibiting chaos. So now we observe that uh, uh, this uh, Wigner-Dyson statistics exist for such kind of systems. So like is there basically is there uh, uh, is this the only single characterization of quantum chaos? No, it's not. Um, yeah, it, it's not. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Um,
Yeah, I, I guess one is, um, so one is free to start with, um, with any definition of classical chaos you like, and then try to turn it into a quantum definition and then see if it satisfies properties that you expect, um, which I guess could mean a whole range of things like that if it's many bodies and it thermalizes and so on, if it's chaotic. Um, so, so the, the um, uh, yeah, um, out of time order correlators, as you know, is the, um, has been, uh, um, uh, has been a definition people have been interested in the last <clears throat> few years, uh, which is different from from this one. Um, but I think the the more interesting question is not so much um, is not so much really uh, what the correct definition is, but is um, how you can calculate things. And um, so in um, in in um, in quantum mechanics, one of the first things we learn is about Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization, and uh, the reason. So, th the reason it's powerful is because it relates a uh, classical quantity to. Uh, we use a uh, classical computation to get uh, an answer for a quantum system. Um, because the. Um, uh, in quantum mechanics, you're supposed to solve Schrodinger's equation, but for a system that's semi-classical, we don't really want to solve Schrodinger's equation. We just want to know uh, the answer approximately in the classical limit, and Bohr-Sommerfeld does that for you. And so a question you might ask is, um, what is one supposed to do for a, for a, um, a system uh, that's classically chaotic when you quantize it? Um, what can you say about the spectrum? Now, you, you could say, um, because Borf-Sommerfeld doesn't work, it doesn't work because Borf-Sommerfeld uh, um, re requires using uh, these, uh, um, the, periodic, the, the periodic orbits, which, which only exist in, in the integral case here. It's the conserved quantities. Um, so you could say, on the one hand, um, so there's no generalization of Borf-Sommerfeld to chaotic systems, but you don't really care because just solve the Schrodinger equation. Um, but that's not really a, a satisfying answer. And um, in remarkable work over, starting with the Gutzwiller trace formula, um, which sort of comes out of the path integral done more carefully, um, one gets this bridge. So it, it goes Gutzwiller trace formula, and then there are other trace formulas. It, it provides this bridge between the, the spectral data of the quantum Hamiltonian and the dynamics of the classical system. Um, so, so all of this is just to say that um, a lot of work has been done in, in connecting um, the classical and the quantum, even in, in cases. I have a uh, question yeah. maybe I can ask. Like usual quantum free theory, we define S matrix. Like we have some initial state we can come yes. to and uh, we uh, can write down some Schwinger Dyson equation and compute the S matrix. So similar kind of thing here also exists. Here is where? Means uh, in the context of quantum field theory uh, uh, well, of chaotic systems. Uh, well, that the S matrix will be the next slide. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, good. So um, th that's right. I think uh, that is sort of the point that in in, in each of these cases, what we do is. Um, in quantum mechanics, uh, people said, okay, the natural thing is not phase space, it's the spectral data. And then yeah. there was this work done to relate that to, to what uh, is natural in, in classical mechanics. And so when going to quantum field theory, that is the motivation hmm. for, for going to the S matrix that we're going to start with what's natural in, uh, in, in our particular context, which is what's natural in quantum field theory and relate that, try to relate that to, um, what was natural in, in classical mechanics and so on. But I, I'm not there yet. But, but uh, here, to compute chaos for some uh, systems, you will consider many body systems. Uh, here, say again? No, I'm saying that like you will consider many body systems rather than uh, like. So this, the discussion, um, these discussions are, were originally done in few body systems. Okay. Um, 
uh, yeah, so so like the BGS paper, um, okay. uh, this one they just did a ball in a stadium. It's a nice building, oh, okay, okay. a few body system. Um, because the, the mini body one, it's less clear. Um, it, it's less, yeah, it's, it's um, the mini body one is harder. Mm. Um, for, for reasons um, I'll get to soon. Um, good. Uh, I have another question. Yes. Uh, sorry, like it's again on the same Wigner Dyson statistics. Yes. So uh, uh, can we say that every quantum chaotic system has to follow this uh, Wigner Dyson statistics? Like, has the conjecture been proven wrong in any case known today? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I would say probably, I'm not sure. Um, it, the, um, I think if you make enough assumptions, then you can prove the conjecture. Um, but, but again, I don't think it's the, uh, yeah. I think if you make enough assumptions, <laughs> you can prove the, you can prove the conjecture. But I'm not, uh, I, I'm not sure how interesting it is by itself because, um, yeah. I mean, ultimately, the the goal is not to just classify if it's chaotic or not chaotic, but it's to, it's uh, it's to compute something, and so um, I, I think the the, res the results on periodic orbit theory and so on are more interesting. Um, yeah. So let me remind you. Um, let me remind you about some of the uh, the major problems involving chaos, um, and what we ultimately, in the very long future, would would hope to to learn. So the the oldest problem is is the computation of correlation functions in fully developed turbulence. So here, by correlation functions, I just mean so you take uh, a fluid that's in the turbulent phase. Uh, and then you, you ask about correlation functions of the velocity field. So it's a classical system, so it's fully predicted, but we're discussing correlation functions because uh, we want statistical averages. So we'll consider uh, two points and uh, compute the correlation functions of the velocity difference uh, for a certain spacing between the two points and then average that over uh, where we take these points. And then we'll ask about correlation functions of the velocity field. And so Famously, Kolmogorov in the 40s um, uh, made an assumption which uh, is basically scale invariance and then um, derived, or not derived, he, um, well, based on the assumption of scale invariance in, in, uh, um, and independence of how, of, and universality, in a few lines, one can make a prediction for how correlation functions will scale. And this is Kolmogorov scaling, so it's basically just dimensional analysis. Uh, um, uh, however, that's not how how the correlation functions actually behave. There's some corrections to these to these exponents, uh, just like for anomalous dimensions. There are corrections to uh, what you would um, be engineering uh, dimensions. The um, those. Uh, and so it's been a long-standing problem to actually have a theory which computes uh, the correlation functions and finds the corrections to Kolmogorov scale. Uh, so, so that's a classical problem. Uh, another problem would be a microscopic derivation of transport coefficients. Th this you can ask for, for quantum systems. Um, a theory of, of thermalization, for, for instance, the response of a system to a quench. Um, and, and the derivation of Hawking radiation, which information is not lost. And so I think um, it, all of these problems involve chaos. And so it would seem that to, to solve any of them, one needs a better understanding of, of chaos. Um, I, as you can see, all these problems are problems in the context of, of many body systems, not few body systems. All right, so, so let's, um, so, so let me now turn to, to the questions that started being asked, what's, why is, um, why is many body chaos challenging? Um, so the, the first challenge that one encounters is that it's hard to make a picture uh, because uh, with, with few body chaos, we had this notion of motion and phase space, uh, rapid expansion of trajectories, stretching and folding and so on. 
Uh, this was all based on phase space that's a few dimensions. Um, in many body chaos, many body systems, the phase space will be enormous and so we can't really make a plot um, because uh, there are too many directions. Um, and so we seem to be struggling in, in stating what's the essential feature um, because it's not clear that it's still stretching and folding um, like it was in, in the Baker's map. Um, and, and, and that's, that's a challenge. Uh, are there any questions? Any questions, please? No. Okay, good. Everybody um, have understood everything. <laughs> but maybe let me emphasize this more why this is, why this is challenging. If you, um, the most obvious thing to do would be to say, okay, let's just treat the many body case just the same as we do few body. We start computing layout and effects, but and so on and so forth. Um, you can do all of that, but um, you'll find, well, um, it, uh, well, let me leave it at that. The, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's not, a, it's, um, it's not obvious how to do, it's not obvious how to even do classical, uh, classical many body chaos. Um, Interesting uh, why it's difficult doesn't seem practical. Um, so, so, but uh, we're going to sidestep that and just go immediately to to um, many body quantum chaos. So, so quantum field theory, and so in looking for characterization of chaos in quantum field theory, um, my goal is not is going to be not to find a quantum generalization of chaos in classical field theory, uh, because we don't really understand chaos in classical field theory that well. Um, uh, nor are we going to try to take the continuum limit of a lattice system, either classical or quantum. This, both of these things would be reasonable. So it would be reasonable to, for instance, if, we're, if we want to study chaos in lambda phi to the fourth theory, you might say, let's just take the classical field theory, you know, box, box phi equals uh, lambda phi cube, understand chaos in that classical field theory, and then, uh, then quantize that field theory. I'm not going to do that because chaos and classical field theory is, is challenging to discuss. And the other thing you might do is you might discretize uh, space and have a lattice, like, you know, a lattice uh, springs. Um, and that's, uh, that's uh, a many body system, but with a finite number. And one could study classical or quantum uh, chaos for this lattice of springs and then try to take the continuum limit as, as a way of getting quantum field theory. Uh, I'm not going to do that either. Um, and instead, we're just going to immediately go to the natural observable of, of quantum field theory, which is the S matrix. So, so the idea is to sidestep uh, the step, which is, uh, which causes uh, difficulties. So, uh, is there is any connection with this S matrix with the usual thing we study, which is out of time ordered correlation functions? Um, good. The so the out of time order correlation functions are give some kind of um, uh, generalization or quantum Lyapunov of exponent, sure. which is which is just which in 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 classical chaos most if you open a classical chaos book there's not that much discussion of Lyapunov of exponents. Um, it's there we mentioned it, but it's um, uh, it's uh, knowing the knowing that the Lyapunov of exponent is this and that number. Uh, doesn't give you the, the full picture of what's happening uh, because in this picture of stretching and folding in a small region of a small smooth region of phase space involving into this complicated shape, um, it's true the layup and effect bone dictates um, uh, at what rate uh, direction points expand away from each other, but that's it. The, uh, all this rich geometric structure is, you don't know that from just knowing the layup and effect bone. Um, and so, um, it seems that one needs um, far more uh, to be computing far more quantities. Um, and so that, that's, um, that, that's the reason just the out of time order correlator by itself 
doesn't seem sufficient to, to really understand chaos. So, so the S matrix to remind you, but you all know. So in scattering experiments, we start with, uh, with far separated wave packets at early times, they start off here, uh, then they interact at intermediate times, and then they lead to far separated wave packets at late times. And the S matrix is the overlap between the end state and the out state. And uh, the point is this vast majority of the infinite number of degrees of freedom that a field theory possesses and which make it so challenging to study chaos are never excited in a scattering experiment. Um, and so th this is one of the, the reasons for avoiding discretizing the system, uh, but just going directly to the S matrix because all these degrees of freedom, we just don't need them. So, uh, so that's, that's going to be the, um, the motivation. So um, with that motivation now, um, so the next question is, well, what's, um, what has been done on chaos in, in scattering in classical mechanics? And that's what I want to discuss next. Um, because usually, um, or at least the, the chaos that we think of when we think of classical mechanics is in closed systems. Um, uh, but it's been studied in open systems and scattering is an example as well. And so let me, let me review that. So open um, system means you are talking about open quantum systems? No, no, no. Open don't mean, uh, I don't mean phase space is finite dimensional. Oh, okay, okay. Um, just open. So like scattering it, uh, oh, it's okay. open, it comes in and leaves. Uh, um, yeah. So, so, uh, an excellent example of this is um, is pinball scattering, or the three disk problem. So, um, so consider the following experiment. Um, so here are three disks, um, and we're going to send a particle in, um, and it's going to elastically scatter off of the three disks. Um, and well, depending on how we send it in, we'll determine what kind of scattering takes place. So if if we send it in an appropriate angle, nothing will happen. It will just leave without hitting anyone. If we send it in like this, it can scatter once or twice and then leave and so on. Um, so generically, it might scatter a, a couple times uh, between the disks and then leave. Um, and then it emerges at some outgoing angle. So uh, there's a map between the impact parameter and the outgoing angle, um, which we can ask to compute that. So, um, so is this chaotic? Um, for most impact parameters, it's clear that the particle will emerge rather quickly. It will just bounce between the disks, maybe no times or once or twice, three, four times. Um, but it seems unlikely that it will spend a long time bouncing back and forth between the disks because this requires fine tuned initial conditions. Um, and so it would seem reasonable to think that the system is not chaotic, the system as formulated. Um, of course, uh, I think um, uh, if the case in which we put this whole thing in a box and let the ball, the particle keep bouncing around and hit off the walls of the box and then bounce around some more, that at this stage we, we would say is chaotic because that's like a ball in a stadium with the outside of the three disks being the stadium. So, so that, that, we, that goes back to uh, things we know are chaotic and there we say, okay, it's chaotic because it can just keep bouncing back and forth. So eventually any small change in initial conditions will get amplified because it just hits so many times. On the other hand here, it just uh, goes in, it might scatter a few times and then it leaves. So um, on first thought, you wouldn't think this is chaotic. I mean, th there's a way to set this up in which on first thought you do think it's chaotic, but Anyway, um, so, so this problem was studied in, in the 80s. It was probably studied before then, but in the 80s, it was really studied in, um, in the context of quantum chaos um, by, by Gaspard and Rice and others. And it's reviewed very nicely by Smolansky in, in his Lezouche lectures. 
So uh, all you need to see is the plot. So uh, Smolensky has a plot of the outgoing angle as a function of the impact parameter. So um, here, here's the impact parameter uh, and here's the deflection angle. And uh, you just do it with various points. Uh, and so as you can see with these impact parameters, it's just the, the angle is smooth, it's just this line. Uh, it's smooth here, here, here. But there are these, this region in, in between where it looks totally erratic. So it's just these scattered points. And here, um, so as you vary the impact parameter over this small region, you can get all kinds of deflection angles, just anything. Um, and, and this lower plot is a zoom in of, of this region. So uh, this goes from 228 to 236. So it's just this small region. And remarkably, this, uh, this chaotic region, once you blow it up, the same structure repeats. So uh, uh, there's regularity here and then chaos here. And if you keep zooming in, the, the structure will keep repeating. Um, so it's a fairly remarkable plot and, and it shows that clearly this is chaotic. Um, you could not ask for anything more chaotic. Um, with, in fact, within any, within um, uh, an arbitrarily small region of impact parameters, you can get an arbitrarily, um, arbit a complete range of, of deflection angles. Um, good. So was, was the announcement I gave that it, maybe it's not getting wrong. Well, it's true that for most impact parameters, the particle will emerge rather quickly, scattering only off of, off of a few disks. But crucially, there exist infinitely many impact parameters that, uh, that lead the particle to spend an arbitrarily long amount of time within the scattering region. And, and this is what causes the erratic behavior. Uh, because it's true if you pick a generic impact parameter, it will just hit a few more times. But if you now start finely tuning, just moving it a little, you'll eventually, well, eventually meaning uh, very close in space, um, hit an impact parameter where it can spend very long, just bouncing um, many times before leaving. And that's what, that's what um, gives rise to this uh, erratic behavior. Yes? Let me actually speed up slightly. Um, so, well, let me just say, so um, what's nice about this example is that specifying initial conditions is clearly challenging, but um, something simple that one can do instead is by labeling uh, the three disks by one, two, and three. And then instead of giving the full trajectory, just stating which disks the particle hits before it escapes. For instance, one, two, one, or uh, one, two, three, two, and, and so on. Um, and, and we could try to use this as a replacement for the initial conditions. Instead of giving the initial conditions, which is this, um, this impact parameter, this is a number, but it's, uh, it's a real number, so it has many digits at the decimal place, and we know we need to keep many because it's chaotic. We'll instead specify which disks, uh, which disks get hit in which order. And as you can see, the number of such symbols grows exponentially with the number of disks that are hit. So if, if, um, if uh, 10 scattering events, if 10 disks get hit before the particle exits, there are two to the 10 different trajectories that could have, uh, could have given that. Uh, the reason it's two, because after you hit one disk, then the next disk has to be, if you hit disk one, then the next one has to be either two or three, um, and so on. And, and this is really what's, what's giving rise to the chaos, this exponential, uh, this exponential number of choices. Um, and here's a picture that I took from, from Svetanovich's book. So here are two different um, initial conditions, the solid line and the dashed line. Um, and uh, so one of these has uh, the solid line, uh, has, has dynamics two, three, so it hits disk two, then three, then one, then three, and then it leaves. So that's the solid line. On the other hand, the dash line, uh, it starts off very slightly separated. It again hits disk two, then three, uh, then one, three, two. Uh, and now you can see it hit two in a very significantly different place from where the solid line hit it. Now it hits three, two, one, and then it escapes. 
Uh, so this small change led to um, a different, different uh, sequence and it leaves in a completely different location. So is it, is it true that if there are two of the, if there are only two disks, then there will be no chaos of this kind? Or? Yes, correct. You need at least three disks. And you need them to be uh, separated on the, if you take them all to be touching, then you won't get chaos. Uh, they, there's, and if you take them super far apart, you also won't get chaos. So there's a range of, of uh, how close they should be. And, and those are analytically understood? The number three um, uh, bounds? Excellent. Uh, so this is, it's quasi analytically understood. So, um, so, so you could ask what's a, what's a quantity, what's a quantity you could compute and then measure. Um, and of course you could start computing Lyapunov exponent, but uh, the thing you would, you would actually be able to measure would be the escape time. So you could say, okay, so uh, on average, how long does it take well, what's the distribution of escape times? Like how long it takes for, for the particle to leave uh, after I shoot it in. And that decays like e to the minus gamma t. And so the question is what's, what's gamma? And that has been computed quasi-analytically using periodic orbit theory. Uh, quasi-analytically, I mean, um, they numerically solve for some simple orbits. Uh, and, then, uh, and then they give a prediction for the escape rate, which is very accurate. Sorry, gamma is again a function of the impinging uh, angle, right? Yeah. Some um, say the uh, average escape time. Yes. Which uh, is a function of the impinging point. No, so good. Um, good, good. Uh, let me back up. So um, there's the question of what we can compute and what we can't compute. So uh, numerically, you can compute everything. Uh, and you can see that it's chaotic. Um, and, and the angle at which it exits is, is an erratic function of the ingoing angle, and that's the plot we just had. Now you could ask, is there a quantity you can compute analytically slash semi-analytically, which is some kind of average quantity? Um, and there you could ask, okay, what's the, if we look over all impact parameters, uh, what's, what's the distribution of escape times? How long it takes to leave? And, and that's the, the thing I'm saying has been computed uh, analytically slash quasi-analytically. But, but that should be a bimodal distribution. I mean, a long tail with some small, uh, so uh, I, I have the feeling that it's just adding uh, apple and oranges uh, over the day. Uh, what's the apple, what's the orange, huh? Like, uh, look, those, the, the, the trajectories that, that that leave uh, early on or the trajectory that get stuck for a long time. So you, you say these are all part of one distribution. Um, uh, let me move on to slide. This was, well, this is in two slides. So let me, uh, uh, let me move on to two slides. Um, gonna, let me skip this and uh, yeah. So this, this was this slide. Um, so, so here's probably, a, so we can ask the fraction of, what is the fraction of initial conditions which lead the escape time to exceed some time t? And that decays exponentially like e to the minus gamma t. And so the precise question is compute gamma. And that's what's been done. Um, uh, and this is what's described in Sotanovich's chaos book. So, so this is a precise question. Is this, does this, uh, do you want to re-ask your question? No, I need to think about it. Thank you. Okay. Um, good. And, and so uh, this large community who, that worked on this in the 80s and 90s, they developed the set of methods, periodic orbit theory, cycle expansion, which, which address questions such as these. Um, and, and again, this is um, this quantity gamma, the, the escape time, this is an experimentally measurable quantity. And so I think it's, it's far more useful than a Lyapunov exponent, which you're not measuring experimentally. Uh, I have a question. Yes. So suppose you treat this thing as a black box. I don't know if there are like three barriers or yes. how many number of barriers. So how much of detail is necessary uh, to characterize this gamma? Or are there like symmetry arguments which will restrict the value which gamma takes? Like, the potential is somehow dictated by some symmetries or something like that. Um, well, let's, let's see. Uh, 
well, in terms of symmetries, there there is some symmetry. Uh, well, if you if you take uh, there is some symmetry, so that uh, uh, um, so that slightly um, that slightly simplifies gamma. Um, in terms of the black hole, I, I think um, I think uh, perhaps you're saying well, this is something I'll say later that this intuitively seems a bit like. Uh, well, I'm not sure what you were saying with the black hole. Uh, I'll say something about black holes later. Mm -hmm. um, no, what I mean is like treat it, treat it as a black box. I don't know what's inside. Ah, uh, good. Uh -huh. And uh, so I want to characterize this scattering barrier. Ah. Uh, without knowing uh, the details. Like the, what is the minimal stuff I need to know about like this barrier, which purely characterizes this escape probability gamma? Well, I think you need the... I think you need the potential. Well, I took the the three disks to be hard disks, so the potential is uh, is you know zero and infinity uh, uh, on these circles, with the boundary being these circles. So I, so depending on the potential, you'll get a different gamma. So you have to, okay. and if you change the configuration of the disk, you'll also get a different gamma. So you really need you really need the precise location of the disks. Um, yeah. All right, so, so I'm but done. This, yes. this, this may not be relevant, but if, 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 if someone solves the Schrodinger, pro, uh, if someone calculates the eigenvalues uh, uh, from a Schrodinger equation of, from this setup, will one also see level statistics? Uh, uh, okay. uh, so this question, the question of, of quantum chaos is what motivated um, the study by, by these uh, by these people, Gaspard and Rice and, and Smolensky and others. Um, so here, it's it's not a closed system. So um, I'm not sure what you would be computing. Yeah. So uh, to solve the Schrodinger equation, yeah. So I don't know how you would um, to. Yeah, that's right. So to solve the Schrodinger equation, good. So you could solve the Schrodinger equation. Uh, you just write the Schrodinger equation with this potential and then solve it. Um, and the good and a conjecture that. Smolansky and Blumel made was that the S, the S matrix that you get, it will behave like a, a random unitary matrix. Um, for for a, for a, so the conjecture was roughly for a for a classically cared. Good. So the conjecture is now on the S matrix because that's what's being computed. It's the quantum mechanical S matrix. So yes. um, so we discretize. So we need to discretize the angular momentum so that we have some finite number of states like n and m so we can label them. And then the, the conjecture that Smolensky made was that that S matrix will behave like a random unitary matrix. But, but that problem has any similarity to this problem? To, means is, is there any mathematical analogy to this uh, classical scattering problem? Is there an analogy where? So in the, in the, in the Schrodinger problem and in this yes. classical scattering problem. So, the, I the, thought, so I thought the question was take just S yes, consider yes. the same setup, but in quantum mechanics. So exactly. find the particle limit in quantum mechanics and solve the, and that you can solve in principle by just solving the Schrodinger equation with this right, potential. Right. Well, what, what I want to ask is, is, is there any limit of that uh, classical answer which will give this, uh, sorry, uh, is there any limit of that quantum answer which will reproduce the gamma that you obtain classically? Is, is there any quantity in the quantum mechanics problem which corresponds to gamma? Ah. Um, yeah, good. Um, good, good, good. So if you were doing quantum mechanics, then, um, then you would be looking at, uh, Paul, then you would be looking at, good. So I think the thing you're thinking of is that, um, when we have quasi bound states, which is what this looks like, then we, we compute, um, uh, th there's a bright Wigner form where, uh, there are poles, um, so, so the, the there are poles where it looks like one over e minus uh, lambda plus i gamma. So uh, there's a pole in the decay lifetime. So indeed, that that sounds similar. Um, yeah. So it means means is it possible to show that uh, there's some classical limit of that which will correspond to this the, the same gamma. Um, Yes, yes. So in, um, good. So the, the case in which you recover, good. So you would recover the, the classical, 
So if you're doing the quantum case, um, you have to consider the high, so we, we send in plane waves of, uh, out of which we form wave packets of momentum case, so you need the high momentum ones to, to get something that's classical. And so you would expect the chaos um, uh, comes in when you consider uh, these concentrated wave packets of, of large momentum, which is when you're recovering classical mechanics. And so it's for those that you would expect. Um, so some of the, expect. the largest pole in the, uh, in, the uh, in the bound state, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the, the largest decay time will correspond to this classical. Like ah, good, 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 good. Um, uh, that sounds, uh, that sounds like a reasonable intuition. Um, Similar that, to this uh, Lyapunov, which is also, uh, there's a semi-classical uh, uh, way to characterize the Lyapunov exponent, right? I mean, um, yes, uh, right, for yeah. semi-classical systems. Sorry. Um, yes. Yeah, uh, you're in. Can you, uh, can you like, uh, can you repeat the question? This system can we include perturbations in the system? Like, if we consider a charge particle and play. Hello, Anurag. Can you repeat the question? We can't. I can able to hear you from. Uh, systems uh, in there. I'm audible now. Yeah, please. Uh, sir, uh, can we include system? Like, uh, if we consider a charged particle and, uh, and like, uh, in boundary, let's suppose that pinballs are boundaries, and if we include some kind of uh, external magnetic field, uh, can we include those kind of systems in? Uh, can we study chaos in those kind of systems? Um. Well, to the extent I understood the question, sure. Uh, you can take a charged particle and then you can take a potential. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, you could, take, uh, you could take some, good, so I think your setup is take this to have uh, some region of positive charge, negative or positive charge or something else. Take, take all three to have positive charge uh, and then take uh, um, a heavy part a uh, light particle of positive charge and then that's like a potential. It's good. So you you want to replace the potential I had, this hard wall potential with um with a one over R potential. Yeah you could do that. Um I I don't know what the what the result would be. Um yeah I, I'm pretty sure that's been done. Good. Okay let me uh let me now move on finally to the quantum field theory. So, um, so this is the, uh, the main point. So, um, so we want to generalize um, this discussion of, of non-relativistic scattering to, to relativistic quantum mechanics. So this requires the language of quantum field theory. And so in quantum field theory, the S matrix is much richer um, because in quantum mechanics, the S matrix is just a phase shift. When we compute the S matrix, we compute the N to M S matrix so we take n particles in the in state with some momentum, m particles in the out state, uh, um, and and we compute this overlap. And so the admittedly vague proposal is um, let's take this uh, S matrix in quantum field theory in the limit in which n and m are large. So we have lots of particles in the in state and lots of particles in the out state. Um, and the proposal is that this, this, um, this will exhibit chaos in, in, the, in the same sense we were seeing in, in classical mechanics that there's erratic behavior under variation of, for instance, one of the individual momenta, such, such as P, which I've distinguished out. So, so that's, the, that's the proposal. Um, take um, take, take the, the S matrix in quantum field theory for, for some non-trivial field theory, look at the S matrix when there's a large number of particles, um, and, and uh, start varying one of the, the momenta and uh, plot, plot what that S matrix will look like. Um, of course, this is challenging to do because we rarely know the S matrix exactly. 
but um, that's that's the proposal. So so the motivation is is clear. It just comes from from the three disk scattering problem. Um, and as we know, the, the quantum field theory S matrix is much richer than the one-to-one -one S matrix in, in mechanics. It really is a uh, a one-to-one -one S matrix because there's just a particle in, particle out, and, and a potential. Because um, here, here it's much richer. And so what I'm thinking of is, so a case in which if we, um, so to imitate this uh, this one-to-one um, -one S matrix in, in mechanics, we, we think of these n particles of momentum uh, p1 through pn as, as playing the role of this potential, which is what I drew here. And then this additional particle is like the particle that's scattering in, in our potential. Uh, so it comes in at p and goes out at q. That's the motivation, anyway. Um, so, so for instance, I could take n particles. They could come in, form three disks, uh, arranged like I had them. Uh, and that stays for a while, and then they eventually go out. Uh, and then this reduces. Are, of course, that's a, a contrived and, and not too interesting limit, um, but but one could do that. Um, so, so that's that's the proposal. Um, the reason the reason for large n. So you might ask, why did I take? Why did I say we need to take n particles where n is large? Uh, why isn't a four to four S matrix or three to three good enough? And the reason for large n is that we have to be far away from the vacuum. Um, to say chaos, we can't be close to the vacuum. In, in the case of the three disk scattering problem, um, it's only three disks, but that's already very far from the vacuum. Um, because three, uh, a disk is, is, is very far from the vacuum. Whereas in quantum field theory, each particle is a fundamental excitation. And so we need to stay with many particles to be far from the vacuum. Um, so, so that's the reason that large n is necessary. This is large n means the number of the n to n s matrix. Um, good. So, so, um, so as I said, there's there are um, since uh, since one can embed non-relativistic quantum mechanics uh, in into quantum field theory. Um, if we take an in-state that just gives this long-lived intermediate state that looks like three disks or, or anything else that, that uh, classical chaos was present in, then we'll recover that. Um, of course, the hope is to get something more interesting. So to, uh, to be able to see chaos in, in, in regions of parameter space where there's no intermediate classical state or some kind of state like a black hole, which is, um, which is, uh, which is more interesting than three disks, which has no analog in, in just classical mechanics. So that's the idea. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, I didn't understand the large n limit. Is it just a mathematical convenience or is it necessary? It's necessary. Well, um, why is, can you say it again? Why? Good. Um, so we need, to see chaos, we need a state that's far from the vacuum. Uh, if you just take a state that has three particles, that's very close to the vacuum, so you won't be able to see, to have any kind of chaos. Um, and the way to get far from the vacuum is, is to have a large number of particles. Um, that's why it's necessary. Um, uh, uh, it's... Uh, why is why do you why can't you see chaos with well three particles? Well, because you can anal because you're close to the vacuum. Uh, because um, the number of quanta is discrete, so it's it's very close to the vacuum. Um, uh, per perhaps alternatively, you could say we need states. We need to be able to form states with high entropy, and so we need. Uh, well, that's just saying the same thing because states with high entropy is just uh, having a large number of states. So yes. Yeah. So large n is necessary. And uh, on a question, so uh, so then what will be the characterization? So are you going to look look at some exponential behavior or means? No. Uh, or yes and no. Good. 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 Um, other questions? Okay. Um, good. So as we saw in the case. So in the case of the three disks scattering, uh, 
I didn't really compute the up and effects points. All I showed was this plot of the outgoing angle as a function of the ingoing angle, and it was completely erratic. Um, and you could have computed a Lyapunov and exponent, um, but, but the plot I made of the erratic behavior is, is more interesting. And so um, uh, it's more interesting and, it, and it's harder to get. And so the claim here is, is the same that, um, the, that you'll see erratic behavior in, in the S matrix when you plot it varying uh, one of the momenta. You could also, if you can do that, then you can easily compute uh, a layup and effect exponent by just focusing in on some region, uh, making a small variation and seeing how it grows. So this would be in this erratic behavior. If you do a small change, then you can zoom in and, and compute the layup and effect exponent if you like. Um, but but the overall structure of this matrix is is richer. Um, but uh, for the case of for the case of a of a black hole, which I'll describe shortly. The S the Lyapunov the exponent is sort of the only thing you can compute because we don't know how to compute the black hole S matrix. Uh, second, there were some questions in the chat window. Let me see. Ah, well, yeah, we already discussed that. Um, good. It, it, but perhaps, well, since the question was asked again, in um, you might say, well, in classical mechanics, we have chaos with the three-body problem. Uh, so why can't we have it with three particles? Uh, well, because three particles in, in quantum field theory is not um, is not uh, three planets in, in in classical mechanics. Uh, annihilate. Um, you can't just annihilate th three planets um, because each planet is composed of many particles. So three planets is far from the vacuum, but but three uh, acting with three a daggers is is very close to the vacuum. Good, um, but there is a proposal of calculating black hole S matrix by um, the, there is an old paper uh, by uh, Paul Chinsky probably by Paul Chinsky probably. Yes, yeah. that's what I'm, that's what I'm, that's my next slide. Yeah, good. Um, so so this proposal was fairly broad. So there is. Um, uh, there's a case in which, in which a field theory S matrix has, an, in which chaos in a field theory S matrix has already been seen in the context of a black hole. And that's what Polchinski pointed out, building on this earlier work by Drian Hoff, uh, Schenker and Stanford and Kintayev. Uh, so let me describe that now. Um, so by appropriately sending in a large number of particles, we can form a black hole as, as an intermediate state, which decays into Hawking quanta at at late time. And now one can ask precisely this, this question we were asking. Uh, suppose we change the in state of, we change one of the in particles, how does this affect the S matrix? Is there chaos? So, so this is um, just a, a specific example of, of, of uh, what we've been discussing. So we send in these particles, we form a black hole. Uh, the black hole is green, the singularity is here, and this is its event horizon. And now, um, and now we add, uh, so right now I'm just describing Polchinski's paper. Um, so, so now we add an additional particle to the end state so uh, that the end state has n plus one particles and where the additional particle interacts with the others much later um, at a time at which the black hole has already formed uh, and is the king into Hawking radiation. So pictorially, this is like this. So uh, we, the in state is still n plus one particles, but n came in here to form the black hole, which has been around for a while and is emitting Hawking quant, and then we throw an additional particle in. So that's the setup. But we're still doing S matrix. Good. Um, any, any questions about the setup? Um, so, so we just changed the in state by sending in an additional particle. Uh, can yes. I ask a question? Uh, I'm sorry if uh, the host uh, may remove me. Uh, so I just wanted to ask that uh, why do we need large number of particles in the setup? Uh, meaning why can't we see chaos for vacuum state? Um, I said that uh, we need large degrees of freedom 
in a quantum system to see effects like yours? Um, I'm. I'm not sure I can give any different answers from from the ones I gave about. Uh, uh, you said that uh, uh, we can't see chaos for a three particle system in quantum mechanics, but I just wanted to get some more intuition. Um, you got cut off. Um, in in quantum mechanics, you can see chaos in a three particle system. Um, but quantum field theory is different. Um, yeah. Is anybody still there? There seem to. Have... Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. let, let me uh, let me continue then. Um, so. Um, Perhaps let me let me give a different answer. Uh, let me try again with that answer about why you need large n. Um, chaos is ultimately some classical effect, and uh, to recover something that resembles uh, classical mechanics, you need to form uh, you need to form a state that's at least quasi-classical. And classical states are composed of many particles, um, and so that's that's why you need many particles. Um, Vladimir, can I also stop you for a second? Yes. Quick question. So um, I understand why you're going to large n, but I have a slightly different question. So you could think of the process moving slightly away from that, and I might have an interesting interplay. Um, so do you think it's feasible to to do some kind of a move slightly away from large n? So look at one of our n corrections, and might you see a good interplay between the more classical aspects of chaos and the more quantum. Um, yeah. Um, uh, let's see. So I think um, I think what I mean is that um, to to get um, to get a function that's extremely erratic, uh, you need infinite n. And then, as you start um, making n finite, then uh, the the functions will get smoothed out. I think it's just like um, it's just like in the case of of uh, the three disk problem. If we consider the quantum case, um, as as uh, as we take the momentum of the wave packets to be very large, then we start recovering the classical completely erratic answer. And as we reduce the the momentum, then quantum mechanics starts smoothing things out. Um, so I think yeah. the same, yeah. So I think the same will happen with with n, that as we reduce, yeah. So I think you're right. We can start reducing n, and then, and then um, that quantum mechanics will smooth things out. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Um, okay. Going back to to the black hole. Um, so here's the black hole. We form the black hole. Then we send an initial particle in, uh, and we want to ask how this changes uh, the S matrix. And so the effect of this additional particle coming in is to shift the black hole horizon slightly outwards. So that's what I've tried to draw here. Uh, so the horizon got a little bigger. I was not totally sure uh, how I should be drawing this horizon getting bigger, so I made it slightly ambiguous. Um, uh, but in any case, so there's Hawking radiation constantly coming out. And because the horizon moved, uh, because we sent this particle in, now this Hawking quanta that's uh, coming out finds itself slightly closer to the horizon than it was before. And now it takes it longer to escape. So uh, in, in more detail, so here's a black hole emitting Hawking radiation. And in the semi-classical picture we use, uh, we know that the Hawking quantum come out sort of equally spaced. And then if we follow them back, evolve back in time, they all start out really close to the horizon. And um, the later they come out, the closer to the horizon they started. Um, and uh, following this back even further in time becomes challenging. Uh, and so if we, if we throw an additional particle to move the horizon slightly outward, that causes uh, a big 
a big change because now these quanta find themselves much closer uh, from their perspective because uh, a small difference for them in distance to the horizon translates into a very large difference in uh, how long it's going to take them to escape. And, and that's what's going to lead to chaos. So, um, so again, so we send the particle in, it absor the black hole absorbs the particle, its horizon, uh, its horizon slightly increases. Um, and the question is, how does this impact the Hawking radiation? So this is easy to calculate. Uh, so here's the black hole metric. Um, so the motion of light is along these null rays. And so we can just, so I just said ds squared equal to zero, we ignore the angular part, and it's just dr over one rh over r equals dt. So we can integrate this from some radius r1 to some radius r2, and that will tell us the amount of time it, it takes to get out. Um, and so we're interested in quanta that start, to get an analog, a nice formula, we take quanta that start close to the horizon, so rh plus some delta, and the escape time scales like this, uh, one over the temperature of the, the black hole times the log of, of the ratio of the horizon to delta. Really, the relevant part is log delta. Um, so so that, that's, that's a simple and correct formula um, for, for the escape time. And so now, now, as we said, we throw the additional quanta in. Uh, this means the, these Hawking radiation now find themselves slightly closer to the horizon. So in effect, we are decreasing delta. Uh, so here I was asking about for quanta starting at RH plus delta. Now I decrease delta bound by which the horizon increased. And this increases the escape time by an exponential amount, uh, which all comes from the fact that the escape time was a log of delta. And so you exponentiate that and you get the, the change in the escape time goes like an exponential uh, two pi times the uh, temp times the temperature of the hole times t. Um, so that's that's a very simple calculation, and that's exactly and so Polchinski got exactly what he wanted that this small perturbation sending this one additional quanta in changed the escape time of of the Hawking quanta by this exponentially large amount. Now, Plachinsky stopped there in, in explaining because I guess he figured it's self-evident this is chaos. Uh, but to elaborate, this is chaos because uh, slightly increasing the, the mass of the black hole, which really is a slight change in, in initial conditions, we just slightly increase the mass of the black hole, causes an exponentially large change in the outstate. Um, why is it an exponentially large change in the outstate? Because uh, if you're an observer standing in the outside, you were expecting a certain sequence Suppose each Hawking quanta carries some information, spin up or spin down. You're, you're expecting some sequence of information coming. Um, and uh, because this quant the quanta you were expecting are now arriving later, uh, when you were expecting something, you got nothing. Uh, and vice versa, and so it's a very large change from nothing to something, um, exponentially large. And, um, as, as a brief technical note, um, so, so uh, this, this calculation is only valid, because we're using semi-classical physics, it's only valid for Hawking radiation emitted less than a scrambling time after the additional particle falls in. Um, so you send the particle in, then there's this small window of time that you can do the computation, but if you wait long enough, then we no longer know what the impact is on the outgoing Hawking quanta after a scrambling time, uh, because this, this entire little semi-classical picture uh, is no longer valid. And so, um, and so the effect on the S matrix is unknown, um, which is just to say that we don't actually know, um, we don't actually know the S matrix for, for this setup. Um, uh, and if we did, we could then see if, if the proposal is, is correct. And, uh, um, and presumably, if, if we knew the S matrix and we plotted it, if the proposal is correct, we would get some kind of very erratic, erratic function. Uh, but the best we can do with the semi-classical thing, which is pretty impressive anyway, is to get this layup and effects bone just this, this small piece of, of this much bigger thing of, of the S matrix. Uh, question? Uh, yes. So is, is, is such a sensitivity also expected for quasi-normal modes? And, uh, I mean, one can check or uh, this, but is it 
you know if this is because um, there we, i am just i want to ask you if it, one can see this in holography also um so the yeah two parts of the question one is uh, yeah whether it's visible in quasi normal modes and if it is then we know how to see it in holography um quasi normal modes are not they're just um um so the well um i'm not sure quasi normal modes are the the um the return to equilibrium after perturbing it i guess an interesting question is does that relate to the lyapunov exponent it's not obvious because um as polchinski pointed out in in his paper the um the quasi normal modes are very uh, in computing the quasi normal modes, it's very sensitive to precisely what kind of black hole you have, what field you're using in the background, and so on. Um, whereas the Lyapunov exponent, it just depends on the surface gravity of the black hole. So uh, that makes it hard to see how, how to relate the two. Um, in terms of holography, well, I guess um, uh, the, um, the relating the Lyapunov exponent has been understood because that was the... Uh, the uh, the whole thing with the work of Kataev, Schenker, Stanford. Um, perhaps your question is, what um, could I, if we translate this proposal about the erratic behavior of the S matrix to um, to the CFT, uh, what what's the proposal for what CFT correlation? I guess in CFTs we only study correlation functions, so you might ask, is there what would be the proposal for what the behavior is of CFT correlation functions for? Uh, a chaotic system. I don't know. Um, yeah. Because there is also a, a routes from the CFT to get to the S matrix in, in the Melian space and doing other checking limits and so on. Yeah, yeah, that could be an interesting question. Um, but yeah, that could be an interesting but, question. I just wanted to uh, know for, means. Does this calculation directly map to something? The the Polchinski calculation, that this escape time, does it map to something known in? Uh, CFT yeah, well, CFT? Polchinski's calculation maps precisely to um, to this to the four point function. Right. Um, so so it it will give the same uh, Lyapunov exponent as probably the OTOC measures in the CFT. Yeah, yeah. But in um, to, in the same way that that um, we we find it challenging to compute a quantum field theory S matrix outside of perturbation theory, which is what would be required to see chaos, we also find it cha challenging to compute correlation functions in a CFT yes. um, outside of the context of taking. Um, because you would have to use an actual heavy state, not just a thermal ensemble. If you use a thermal ensemble, you'll just average out all, all the chaos. So it's not sufficient to just be computing correlation functions in the thermal state. You really have to uh, make the state yourself. Um, mm -hmm. And so then, then it will again become hard to do the calculation. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, so in this talk, uh, as you can tell, I haven't presented any actual results, but more of motivation for, for studying chaos in, uh, in the S matrix. Um, and so in work in progress with David Gross, we, we studied chaos in string theory scattering, and we believe we've seen chaos. Um, uh, and this I'll present on October 2nd <laughs> uh, at the ITS symposium. Um, Chaos and many body quantum systems. There's also going to be another symposium for which I'm one of the co organizers on September 25th, which is also titled Chaos and Quantum Field Theory. Uh, and for more details, go to itscuny.org. Um, so I hope on October 2nd I'll have um, concrete things to say. Um, so uh, there's a side remark on, so th that's, that's the, the end of the bulk of the talk. There's a side remark on analyticity that um, I, which is interesting, which I'll make if there's additional time, but maybe let's uh, save their questions first. Okay, then let me uh, make this remark. Um, so at some, uh, 
At some intuitive feeling, one always feels that there's a tension between chaos and solvability. Um, and certainly in some chaotic systems, one can perform analytic or semi-analytic computations, especially of average quantities as we've been discussing, like the escape time in the three disk scattering problem or transport coefficients in SYK. Um, um, but still one feels like there's a tension and uh, the tension is that analytic functions formally are those which if known in a small region are known everywhere. That's sort of the definition. More practically, these functions are smooth. I mean smooth in the colloquial sense as well. And so this isn't really what functions in chaotic systems look like. Um, the, uh, when we saw the outgoing angle as a function of impact parameter for the three disk scattering, that we wouldn't know what kind of function to write for, for that answer. Um, perhaps stated differently, the functions we're familiar with, like sine x, so on, they're all periodic. And we're not really familiar with functions that are totally erratic. And so um, if we, if, even if we go to classical mechanics and say, okay, can we analytically solve? Uh, it's hard to see what, what form the answer will look like, what function are we trying to get out? Um, so th th that's one way of saying attention. There is, however, um, a remarkable analytic example of, of chaos and scattering in quantum mechanics. Um, where it's chaotic and you can get an analytic function. Um, so, so let me briefly describe that. Um, it's not really related to the rest of the talk. Well, aside from having the same combination of, of words. Um, so this, this example was discussed in chaos goods, so what one does is one takes, so this is going to be scattering on a torus with a cusp, which is what's drawn here. So one takes a piece of hyperbolic space, so that we're familiar with, the s squared, the x squared plus the y squared over y squared, and uh, we cut out a piece of it and we identify the side. So the piece we cut out is what's drawn here, and we identify this side with this side and that side with that side. So that's like roughly what we do when constructing a, a torus, we identify, you know, there are four sides, we identify two and two. Uh, and that's what we're doing here. The, the only, the difference here is that here we took out a cutout of hyperbolic space, so um, y equals zero is, is here. Uh, and so all these points, min y equals zero, x is minus one, zero and one, and y equals infinity out here are all going to get identified to the same point by this identification. And that point is, is, is what's illustrated here, this, this tip of the cusp. So what we get is a torus with a cusp that goes out to infinity. Uh, and the torus is made out of a piece of hyperbolic space. Um, and so, so that's the setup. And so we're going to consider scattering on this cuspy torus. Any questions? So, um, so th that's what was done. So we, so it's like just like we do scattering in quantum mechanics, where there's some potential, we send in a wave that scatters all the potential that comes back. Uh, here we're doing the exact same thing, but uh, now what? What we have, uh, the geometry is this torus for the cusp. And so we send uh, ingoing waves from infinity through the cusp out here, they go in, uh, they do something, they come out, and then we uh, can observe the phase shift of the outgoing waves. And so we do this by solving the Schrodinger equation and at large y, which is out here. Um, and after integrating over x, what we get is a superposition of an incoming and outgoing wave. So y to the one half minus ik, k is the momentum. It's written in this way because, um, because we have hyperbolic space. I mean, the reason it doesn't look like e to the i, uh, e to the i p z, like e to the i k z like you're used to is because z is log y, because it's hyperbolic space. So this is um, the ingoing wave, and then there's an outgoing wave, which is this complex conjugate. And then there's a phase shift, which is the S matrix, S of k. And so the question is, what is the S matrix? And this is what was computed in the 70s. And the S matrix is, is expressed in terms of this function z of 1 plus 2 ik over z of 1 minus 2 ik, where z of x involves a gamma function, which is uninteresting, and the Riemann zeta function, zeta of x. So the S matrix involves the Riemann zeta function at, uh, at argument 1 plus 2 ik, where k is the momentum. So that's the answer. And uh, 
the, the remarkable thing is that the, the zeta function at a complex argument, if you plot it, here's a plot, it looks at, at large k, it looks completely erratic. Um, so it, so there, uh, even if you see some kind of periodicity, it's fake because, so in some regions it seems to repeat, but if you zoom in, it's not really repeating. Um, and this is, uh, this is precisely what we wanted, uh, a function that's both analytic and completely erratic. Um, so that's it. So this is, an, is yes. Is there also a fractal structure to this, like uh, it was there in the three, three, three disk problem? A what structure? Say again. Fractal, fractal, like a repeating, self-repeating structure. Ah. Um, if you zoom in, do you also see any self-repetitions? Ah, good. There, the self-repeating structure was because for some angles it wasn't k. Okay. Yeah, and um. Ah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know. I just zoomed into a piece of the Riemann zeta function where it looked erratic. I don't know what it looks like in other regions. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, and so I guess um, the going back to what we care about, which is many body physics, it would obviously ni be nice if there was a many body analog of this, of, of this scattering on the cusp of torus, meaning a chaotic system which was completely solved and a function analytic and chaotic. Um, the system that comes to mind is SYK, but I should note that SYK doesn't count because it's only analytically solvable with large n. Uh, and so there we can compute, analytically compute large n thermal correlation functions, and then the out of time order ones uh, exhibit early time chaos uh, in the sense of exponential growth, but we only ever get smooth functions. Um, presumably to get a non-smooth function would require finite n, and then we would have to do even an SYK, the computation numerically. So SYK is not, is not an, an example of, of, of a system that does this. All right, uh, let me stop there. Thank you. So thank you very much for giving uh, such a nice introduction. <clears throat> and uh, I would uh, ask the like uh, listeners and attendees to ask questions. If you have anything to ask specifically, you please ask. So apart from this SYK model, can you give uh, one example where uh, like we can calculate such as matrices? Um, well, I'll try to give an example in October with, uh, with the strings theory as matrix. Um, but um, yes, I don't, um, there are no, there are no, there's no uh, other example that immediately. Um, 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 well, it, it yeah. Um, sorry. Uh, you you also you had a statement about uh, uh, the ne necessity of a non perturbative calculation, right? So uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So so but but uh, well, means if I if I just calculate it perturbatively using normal PFT techniques, then uh, it means uh, means won't that be also a couldn't that be also a signature of, uh, couldn't also that show some chaotic behavior if I do perturbation in? in um, well, some kind of perturbation theory might work, but you can't, um, perturbing around a free theory uh, is not going to work because, um, um, I mean, if you just have a, a harmonic oscillator uh, that's integrable and then, um, uh, and then, so take a harmonic oscillator, uh, p squared plus x squared with a potential x squared that you can solve. Now you can add a potential x to the fourth uh, and start perturbatively computing in, in this coupling. You're not going to see anything that interesting. Um, so it, it's true that 
um, that that system is no longer integrable. Uh, but if if you look at low energies, you're not going to be able to tell that your potential is really quartic and not quadratic. And so if you plot phase space at low energies, it will look essentially like a different integrable case. Um, and then if you start going to larger energies, you'll start getting a deviation, but that's when your perturbation theory will break down. Um, so one has to do something, um, something more, intel more intelligent. And th this, is, uh, this is encoded in this. My statement that if you look at low energies, you won't notice this quartic is basically the KAM theorem, which, mm -hmm. which said that if you, which basically quantified, um, quantified when you break integrability, uh, what starts happening. Um, but, but yeah, um, to see something in, yeah. This is this is just the uh, this is just the the problem in the very beginning that we have poor intuition for chaos because uh, you can't get chaos by just uh, by doing perturbation theory to a few orders around integral things. Right. But for example, for a inverted harmonic oscillator, maybe one can get uh, maybe because, yeah 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 no the statement of, of no certainly there exists some. Um, there exist some things which are chaotic, which we can hope to analytically and numerically understand. Uh, I'm just saying that it requires uh, some additional input. You can't just uh, uh, pick up Peskin and start computing for lambda phi to the fourth and uh, because you won't see anything. Also, the, the inverter harmonic oscillator is non-trivial as well because um, uh, if you just take the potential minus x squared, that's not a that's not a real quantum system. So you have to put something below, uh, and then uh, and then you again have a difficulty of how you're going to compute. So then you might try to separate uh, these two regions, the, this one and that one, and so on. Any more question, please, from the audience? If not, then please uh, unmute yourself and give a clap for Vladimir for giving such a nice talk. So like, I will upload this talk and uh, will send you the link very soon.